I greet you once again in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a joy to be here sharing with you First John. We have had quite a, a wonderful season and now we are actually coming to the close as we come to the final chapter, chapter 5. As we would have studied John, we would have seen where John spoke very strongly about love, about obedience and about faith and actually as he comes to chapter to five, he will make mention of all three. One of the key components of the book, though, is the fact that John spoke about the love of God. He said that God is love. And we can understand why he is known as the apostle of love. And he is called John the Beloved. He was the one that we would always see resting on Jesus' breast. And so he is that apostle of love. And we see that all through his his writings in the Gospel of John it is very strongly reflected and even as we have studied first John we have seen this beloved disciple share so much on love one of the key components of the love that he shared is that the love of God has been dis how we can it has been disseminated to those who are born of God and those who are now born of God we are now to disseminate that love to all our brethren and so even as we come to chapter 5 we will see him once again reinforcing that and the whole idea is the fact that God is our father we are his children and he has placed us in a family. And just as it is in the natural, you have a father, you have parents, you have children, and those children, very naturally, they love each other, they care for each other. Now we know that we have the enemy who comes in and creates division within the family. And similarly, this is how the enemy works. And so we have to watch the enemy because he comes to destroy that love. And so John is saying, God is love. 
He has shared that love with us. We ought to share it with each other because we belong to a family. And if we get nothing out of this particular book, I trust that we will come to understand more than ever that we who are born of God, we who are born again, we belong to a family. God has placed us in a family. We have siblings in the family that needs our love and our care. And so if at least we can go home with that, we would be a changed people, a transformed people. Our natural families will be better for it and the family of God will be in a better place because the Father is well pleased when the love that he has given to us, we are willing to share that love with each other. So let's look now at chapter 5, reading verses 1 and 2. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth, loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So we see here that John is writing on the basis of two key truths. One, the fact that love of God and love of man is inseparable. That's the basis upon which he's writing. Love of God and love of man is inseparable. In other words, it ought to be one experience. God loving us and we loving others. One dynamic experience. And secondly, he would also uh, be thinking, as I shared, about the natural love. Just as how we will naturally love our brothers and sisters sisters within our blood family, now we who are of one blood, born of God, through that blood, he has made us one, and so we ought to love one another. So John is saying that this love, it actually binds us. Whoever believes, let's just try to break it up again, break it up here. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, okay, so that the basis of this love is belief in Jesus is the Christ. Because when we believe that Jesus is the Christ, what moves on? He is born of God. So we believe that Jesus is the Christ, then we are born of God. And so everyone now who, ha who, who is born of God and who have received that love, we are now to share that love. He said, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and a little bit more and keep his commandments, when we love God and we keep his commandments. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So let's look at it. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Now, what God is saying to us, he has given us his love, and all he wants in response to that love is keeping his commandments. So if the commandment is to love one another, then we must keep that commandment. And it goes on to say, his commandments are not grievous. In other words... The commandments that God has given to us, it's not a burden. Remember Jesus himself saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is great about God? There is no request that God makes of us that he does not give the provision for it. So if he says to us we are to keep his commandments, he is not going to leave us hanging on a limb and wondering how we are going to keep these commandments. We are to keep the commandments simply because he has given us the tool 
use uh, to equip us to keep uh, his commandments. He says, so whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. How powerful, how powerful. Whatsoever is born of God. And I can say, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. We are on the winning side. We are on the victory side. We overcome, we overcome the world because we are born of God. He has given us the power to do that. We are not to be defeated. The Christian is not to live a defeated life. We are on the winning side. We are on the overcoming side. And he goes on to say, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. There is a victory that overcomes the world. What is that victory? That victory is faith. That victory is faith. And let's look at what he says here. He says, and this is the victory going on now to the remaining of the verse that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. What is our victory? Our victory is faith. And what is our faith? Our faith is in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. The faith that God speaks about is not a faith in any man. It's not a faith in anything. It's not a faith in any other, other than Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ is believed in, when we cast our faith in him, the Bible says to us that we have a victory that indeed overcomes the world. And we are reminded when we talk about the world, we are not talking about the world geographically. While it will cover um, a geographic space, space wherever you are. But the world we are talking about is that diabolic, devilish system that wants to come at us, that wants to overrun us, that wants to put us in defeat. The scripture is saying when we believe in Jesus, we have a faith in him that will overcome every plot, every plan of the systems of this world. It does not matter how bad it gets. The faith we have in Jesus is an overcoming faith. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's move on. Verses 6 to 8. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three agree in one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So let's look for a moment. This is he that came by water and the blood. Now, if we were to go back a bit earlier with respect to the teachings of the Gnostics, do not forget that uh, the Apostle John is defending, he is defending the truth of God's word as against the lies and the false teachings of the Gnostics. And remember, in their thinking, when Jesus got baptized, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, when he, the, the Spirit came upon him, but after the Spirit came, came upon him, he was no longer divine. He was no longer divine. And so John is bringing out here, listen, when he came, he came by water and blood. Now we will know even in the natural, when a baby is born, you have that water bath that has to burst, and you have that blood, that placenta in which the child comes. And what John is bringing out here is a twofold meaning. When Jesus came, Jesus came, he was not all God. He was God, and he was human. He was divine, and he was human. He was both. And so he came in, even though he was divine, through the natural course. Even though he was born of a virgin, 
virgin and even though he was conceived by the Holy Ghost when Jesus was born of Mary he came as any natural human being will come he came by water and he came by blood but further more than that and even uh, more significant than that is the fact that when Jesus came in order to, to authenticate his messiahship we see the picture of him by water and by blood by water referring to the fact that he was baptized Jesus didn't need to be baptized he was baptized for an example to us but at the same time in his baptism scripture is demonstrating what God did so apart from coming as a human yet still with the embodiment of divine in him as he begins his ministry what happens he begins his ministry by water that's how he began his ministry and the scripture tells us this Matthew 3 16 and Jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him so he came into his messiahship by water and that water is referring to water baptism and so that was the beginning and what concluded his time here on earth as the divine and as human what concluded it was the shedding of his blood so he came by water and he came by blood through his baptism and through his death we have the complete work that Jesus Christ came to do and John says not by water only he did not stop with baptism but he went on to die the death the sacrificial death he went on to pay the price he came to do a work that started at a point and will finish at a point hence when his blood was shed and he was on that cross breathing his last breath he said it is is finished it was indeed a work that was started and was completed and it says it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is true is truth and so now he's talking about a witness now you know we know in in scripture let me see uh due to run in me i should have that scripture somewhere here let me just give me a minute here yes deuteronomy 19 and verse 15 one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sins at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established deuteronomy 17 6 at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death and so the scripture is saying here that jesus there was someone to testify concerning Jesus. Who was that someone? That someone was the Holy Spirit. And then the scripture goes on to say, for, no, let me, let me bring this out, because the Spirit is true. So let's not forget that the Holy Spirit is not a spirit of lie. Remember, he's dealing with lies. He's coming against lies. And so he said, the Spirit that bore witness concerning Jesus when he came upon him that day in that water, as he was coming out of the water, that Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He said, for there are three that bear record. Why is he saying there are three? He saying there are three because they very well knew the scriptures and they knew in order for, for something to be solidified there must be either two or three witnesses and so he says there are three that bear record in other words that witness that testify to the fact and they are in heaven and that's the father 
The word, and of course the word was in the beginning with God, that Logos, that is Jesus himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he goes on here, we have a theological statement here. He says these three agree in one. So we know Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three agreeing in one because there is one God. And then he says there are three that be a witness in the earth. So there is a witness in the heaven, hallelujah. There's a witness in the heaven, but God did not stop there. He ensured that there was a witness on the earth. And so he says there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, and he appeared that day that Jesus got baptized, and the water, his baptism, and the blood. So we have the spirit, the water, and at the end of his life, we have the blood, and these three agree in one. So just as how the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they are one, we are seeing now where the spirit, the water, and the blood agree or be a witness or testify to the fact that Jesus is indeed the Christ. Verses 9 to 10. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God had the witness in himself, and he that believeth not God had made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And he says, if we receive the witness of men, what is he saying? He said, listen, based on God's word, what do we do? We, we stand by that word and we ensure that there are witnesses to testify before we come to a decision. He says, and based on God's word, that's what you do. So you bring men to witness, you listen to what they have to say, and you come to a conclusion. And so he is saying, so if you could do that with men who, you know, <laughs> many of us will know. There are men who will witness and they will lie, I mean, you name it, with a straight face. And what John is saying is that you will believe these men when they speak because you know some people they can speak so well, they are orators. He said, how much more should you believe the witness of God because you are believing the witness of men? He says, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his son. So he's saying, listen to the voice of the father. The, fo the, the father has given witness. When did the father give that witness? Right at his baptism. At his baptism, the father spoke. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we have the testimony of the father speaking from heaven. And he said, you're listening to men and you're making a decision. Can't you listen to God and make a decision concerning what God has said? God has testified that Jesus is indeed his son. He goes on to say, he that believeth on the son hath the witness in himself. Now this is, this is so wonderful because what it is saying to us is that when you 
put your faith. And you know, I, I don't know who you are this evening, but what I'm saying to you, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you do that, there is a witness in your heart. There is a confirmation in your spirit that you have done the right thing. So he says, he that believeth on the Son had the witness in himself. There is a witness that we have within our hearts of the Holy Spirit. Now what we need to remember is that when Jesus left the earth, he said, I am leaving, but I am going to send another one. He will come and he will guide you and he will lead you. In other words, I am a witness here now of the father. But when I go, the third person of the Godhead is going to come to earth. And when he comes to earth, he is going to witness to you when you make that decision to believe in me. And let me just look a few moments here at some scriptures as it relates to the Holy Spirit's moving. Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here they were in the upper room, waiting for what? Waiting for a witness. Waiting for a witness. Jesus said he will send that witness. And when that witness came, in that first experience, he was powerful. It was mighty. It was so awesome. The scripture tells us that the earth shook. It trembled even when he came. Not too long after when the disciples went and ministered to the Samaritans. Here what the scripture said. Who went they will come down. They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he had not yet fallen on none of them. Only that they believed in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And as they laid hands and they received the Holy Spirit, that was a witness to them that listen we are definitely in Christ. Look at with the Gentiles, not just the group of Samaritans, but to the Gentile world, the scripture says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Did you hear that? All of them. So when the word was preached, what was necessary? A witness was necessary. And who was that witness? That witness was the Holy Ghost. And he came and he fell upon them. They spoke in tongues as the scripture tells us. And it goes on to say, he that believeth not God had made him a liar. In other words, after God has done all that he has done, after God has sent his son Jesus, and we're talking now particularly to the Jew, to Jews to whom he was speaking at the time, after God had done all that he had done, you reject this Jesus. After God opened the heavens and he spoke, after God brought Jesus into this world through, I mean, the virgin world, dynamic and miraculous, after Jesus living and breathing and talking and ministering, after all of that, you don't believe God? How faithless can you get? He said, and in so doing, what you are actually saying is that God isn't speaking the truth. God is a liar. So when we do not believe in Jesus, the scripture teaches that we make God a liar. We make him a liar. Because why? Because he believeth not the record that God gave his son. You see that word? The record. In other words, all of the witnesses, all of the apostles who took time to write, to write, to give us the record. He said, you are not believing the record that Jesus has indeed come and that God has given his son. Let's look at verses 11 to 13. And this is the record. This is the report, all right? That God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. 
and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. So this is the record. What's the record? The record is that God has given to us eternal life. And I want to bring out that word. Remember, we took quite a bit of time and we spoke about that eternal life. It comes from that word Ionios, Ionios, which means far more than just living forever. It has to do with a life that lasts beyond and beyond and beyond and so that I us is what God has given to us it is the eternal life and that eternal is connected now to life which is the Zoe so the on and on and on and on life of God when we indeed believe the record he said and this life is in his son so in other words if we are to enjoy eternal life and and let me take a minute just in case you miss the, the early part eternal life in this context speaking to those who have received christ but we need to also know that there is an eternal life a different kind of life in hell forever and ever and ever. But he is speaking here concerning the eternal life that Jesus gives when we believe. And if we don't believe his son, then we cannot enjoy eternal life. And remember, eternal life is not just something we look forward to. Eternal life begins the moment we receive Jesus Christ. It is the abundant life. It is a life that we enjoy now and we also will enjoy it in the hereafter. He said, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Now, this is a very clear statement. Now, you may want to believe otherwise, but according to God's word, what the word of God is saying here is, listen, if you are to inherit, if you are to receive the eternal life from God, you are only going to get it through your belief in Jesus Christ. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, that is the only way you will enjoy that eternal life. He said, these things have I written unto you, that believe in the name of the Son, that you may know that you have. So what John is doing is saying, listen, I am writing because I want to give you a confirmation. I want you to know that eternal life is not something you have to wonder if you have. You have to be confused if you have it. He says eternal life is given to you by God. God has given you the spirit of God which will give you the witness that you have eternal life. He said, I, John, am writing to you so that you could know that you have eternal life. And that life, he says, is again believing in the name of the Son of God, and that you may believe, you may believe, you may believe, if we do not believe in the Son of God, if we do not believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son, if we do not believe that Christ has come to the earth to save all mankind, if we do not believe that God has expressed and God has demonstrated his love to us through Jesus Christ, then we are in trouble. And the trouble that we are in is that we will face a Christ-less eternity. And a Christ-less eternity is a devil more eternity. Verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 
And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So let's look now. He is going to talk about prayer actually. And the basis of prayer is the simple fact that God listens to our prayer. I want to bring out the principle of prayer. And the principle of prayer, the principle of prayer has to do with the will of God. He says that obedience is a condition for prayer. In other words, we receive what we ask because we keep his commandments. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, he spoke earlier about walking in obedience, and the truth of the matter is, as we walk in obedience to God's word, there is a power that we have with God. There is a power you have with God when you walk in obedience to his word. And that power is the power of prayer. He says this is how we have the, the confidence. What is the confidence? The assurance, the confirmation in our hearts that if we ask anything. But he says here concerning prayer is one of the principles of prayer is that we must ask according to God's will according to God's will. How do we ask according to his will? Not just by tacking on according to your will or your will be done. No, but within our hearts as we pray, having the recognition that not everything we ask God for, that it may be of God. And so when we understand that not everything we speak to God will be of God, so what do we do? We take time even as we talk to God to listen to God. And the Spirit of God begins to give direction to our prayer so that as we pray, we will now pray according to the will of God. He says that if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. Now, if you read that verse by itself, you will think that whatever I ask of God, I will get. No, you have to read it in its context. Firstly, he said, according to the will of God. And so anything we pray according to God's will, he indeed will answer. If anyone sees his brother, so we are moving now into another section here as we close. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. And basically what the scripture is saying is that Let's just talk about the sin not yet leading to death. There is sin that we can always confess, that we can always repent of. There, once there is life, there is hope. Because there is a room to confess for sin. There is also room for you to talk to a brother or to a sister. If you realize that they are doing something that they need to repent of. However, he is talking about a sin unto death. What is that sin unto death? And basically what he is saying, it has a lot to do with choice. With choice. There are some people who have made a choice to keep on sinning. And they don't want to hear they don't care what you say. They are, how should I put it? They are locked into the fact that they want to continue to commit sin. And that is what you call the sin unto death. The sin unto death is the sin that will lead you to separation from God when you have made a choice against God. 
So once we are living, there is the hope of confession. There is the hope of forgiveness. But if we continue in our way, a good, good example of that, um, and we spoke about him earlier, was Cain. Cain is a good example of that. Cain had all the right things laid before him, but Cain made a deliberate choice to do it his way. And so once there are those out there who have made deliberate choices, choices against God, deliberate choices to sin and to do wrong. There is no space. There is no repentance because if they don't want to repent, then there is no room for God to forgive. God is willing to forgive all the way to your death's bed, but you must want his forgiveness. You must believe in him. You must desire that he forgives you, but once you are anti Christ, and this is what it boils down to. You are anti Christ. You are dogmatic. You are a unbe an unbeliever. You do not want any part of God. And so, no matter how people talk to you, that's the way you want to go. Then that is considered the sin unto death because there is no room for repentance if you, out of your own heart, are not prepared to repent. God is not going to tamper with anyone's will. We must want what God offers. We know, and then he says, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. So in other words, all unrighteousness is sin. But there is sin, once repented of, it will not lead to death. But once unrepented, and we die in that condition, of course, hell will be our portion. And then he says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Again, John is repeating it in a different way. You do not practice sin once you are born of God. He's reinforcing it as he comes to a close. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Woo! He keeps himself. When you are born of God, and even though it is written in this form, the whole idea is, listen, God has given us the power to be kept by him. He is the one who truly keeps us. But as we continue to walk in obedience, as we continue to follow God in, in, in its true sense, God is indeed, um, we are going to be kept by God. He said, and the wicked one will not touch us. The secret to your Christian life, the secret to your victory over sin, the secret, the secret to your overcoming the devil is walking in love to God, to our fellow men, obeying his commandments. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. And remember, John is writing from, from, from Ephesus. That's where he's writing from. And we have all the idol worship with Diana of the Ephesians, and he said, listen, stay away from that, stay away from pagan practices, follow after God, and God is going to work for you. And so this evening, as we conclude, love God with all your heart, because he has given his son for you. He has expressed his love to you. Love him with everything you have. Make every attempt to love those around you with all that God has given to you. Walk in obedience to God. God's commandment. When you pray, you will have power with God, and no devil in hell has any power over you. We are victors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for the Apostle John. Lord, he's long gone on with you, but his words, because it's the word of God that lives and abides forever, ministering to our hearts today, continue to strive Strengthen us in your word as we believe in the only begotten Son of the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In Jesus' name, amen.